before I get into the actual content, like I said, today might be a really like special day for us. Like this could be the day where we're like, hey, this is kind of the, one of the places where we launched like actual ecosystems that made sense and they were coherent in C++. We've been wanting this for so long, right? Like so long. Like, and, and we're not, we're here to say like, let's do this, right? But it's also another really special day for a very special person to me. My daughter's turning six years old today. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I just wanted to say happy birthday, I love you. I'll be home soon. Um, so getting into the actual technical stuff, here are the con here's the contact info for me and Bill, if you want to get hold of us for some reason. Um, the, by the way, a lot of these, especially my slides, will have URLs or something on them, so if you're the kind of person that likes you know, taking photos so you can re reference back, that, that's fine. Um, we'll, of course, share the slides pretty quickly here. Um, let's, let's kick it off. What, why, what are we doing? Why are we even doing this? Actually, let's kick off with what we're not doing. How about that? Um, when I talk about these kinds of things with people in hallways and other discussions, a lot of ideas start getting jumbled up together. I just want to clarify some scope things so that we all understand where we're going to start out here. So we're not going to be talking about package archive formats yet. That would be things like uh, RPM files, dev files, different package managers have those. Maybe someday we can talk about those. Not yet, though. Um, same thing for package managers. We, we, there's a lot of those. We're not talking about a C++ package manager, like where you would be running a command that installs things. We're also not talking about source repository structure. We're not pitching a CXX project TOML file that, that might look like the ones you've seen from other languages, right? Um, there's actually an ISO paper here, P1204, that is exactly that kind of proposal. We've seen it in the past. Also not talking about build workflows, like you know, the configure and make and make install workflow that's really popular in POSIX systems. Why not? Well, it's really important to us that this actually goes somewhere, and so we're gonna start out somewhere where we feel like we're gonna have a lot of traction to kick off, right? Adoption friction is a key phrase, and I'll hit on that more. Then what are we talking about? We're talking about something pretty simple to start out with in a good way. We were talking about package archive contents would be a way to think about it if you're coming from a package management system. Like, if you opened up that package, what would you see inside? And specifically, we wanna see specific metadata files in a easily locatable places that will describe the rest of that package, especially with respect to what libraries are contained in those packages. And of course, out of that, we're gonna see some modest interoperability requirements using that metadata. Right, so in short, we want to declare libraries. We want there to be a thing, a real thing, called a C or C++ library. You may be surprised, that is not a thing yet. It's just a bunch of things people do. We just have conventions, just like we do for a lot of other things, like how do we namespace macros? Well, you just name them this way and then you don't have problems. We do the same thing for our tools. I think we can do better. So more proactively, what, like, well, more positively, what do we want to do with our goals? So we want a first step for a more robust packaging ecosystem. This, this isn't gonna be everything you'll ever want ever. A lot of people have a big laundry list, and Tyler was giving me, this guy named Tyler, gave me a really long laundry list yesterday. I wanna to get to that whole list. This is the first one we wanna to get to though. Um, again, explicit metadata with a specification, something that everyone can use. You don't have to be the secret sauce or use our implementation some specific way, right? All, we want it to work everywhere. This is new, let's, hit, let's set the standard right there and not compromise on making sure it works on every single platform. That is a big challenge right now with package management systems, is some are great, except it doesn't work everywhere, right? We want it to be polyglot, fundamentally. Our ecosystem is a polyglot ecosystem. The, some of the most popular uses of C and C++ are to, so when, when higher level languages need to drop down and do the real hardcore power user, get under the bits and fiddle with them kind of work, and that has to work. We have to be able to bridge that gap. And similarly, there are low, low level things that we call from C++, including other C++, but there may be Fortran, C, that kind of thing, that also needs to be supported in the, in the dependency management system. That's why we're not talking about specifically a C++ package manager. We're actually talking about a broader way to, like it's a kind of like an ELF or a Windows ABI kind of package, package management uh, standards, if, so to speak. We want, and another way to phrase all this is, I want projects that are as portable as the code you write. You spend a lot of time making sure your C++ works everywhere. Your project should go everywhere as well. 
and they should be more and more like cattle and less and less like pets. We cannot have readme-driven dependency management. It is not a scalable solution. Why dependency management? Of all the projects I can work on, why am I doing this? Why is Brett the crazy guy, like world-renowned apparently for tooling stuff, why am I so passionate about dependency management? And it's because you are. I care about the users, and this is the feedback we get from you all. This is an ISO survey we took this year. The responses to this survey, which is very statistically significant, show that by far the biggest pain point you all point out is that managing your libraries is your biggest pain point. Of all the cool language features we talk about in these sessions, this is the problem you point out is the thing you want to get, you want to get progress on. And I'll point out numbers three, five, and six, um, setting up your CI, setting up your IDEs, and, and even getting your build system like CMake to work properly are all very much downstream of these problems. As, a, as someone that works with people day in, day out to solve their problems and getting their C++ developer experience working the right way, these questions keep popping up over and over, and a lot of them come right back to, well, you didn't install the dependency the way you were supposed to. Let's talk about those pain points in a little more detail. Put yourself in the shoes of someone that's learning C++. Almost everyone here has been doing it, at least as a very strong hobby for quite some time. But go back to nothing. You, you write your first file, you add your first code, and you see this. It says missing, no such file or directory on some file that you did a, a pound include directive on. What, what does that mean? Where do you start? You go to Stack Overflow, you post that, and what do they reply to you? It's actually a very long list of things that could cause this. It could be spelling errors. Well, uh, very commonly, is the problem is well, you have a dependency management problem. That, and that's what I'm saying. This could be caused by a lot of things. And so it makes it really hard for both the person you're asking the question and the person answering the question to really have a frame of reference to talk about what went wrong. Similarly, we can see similar things happening with implementations not being provided. Maybe the interfaces are visible, but the implementations are not available or obvious to the build system, and you get things like missing symbols and undefined references. Likewise, you can also get at, beyond that point, actually get a full link, get into production code, and have crashes because your dependencies are incoherent. They're not built in a consistent way. Nothing in particular is gonna help you figure that out, except you're gonna get a crash, and then you know, hope you, hopefully you go to Greg Law's talks about debugging, because you're gonna need it. And this is an example you see in other parts of the tooling ecosystem. This is a CMake error about a dependency management issue where you could not find the CMake metadata files to clarify the things that could have gone wrong on the previous slide. And this is a longer text, piece of text because CMake thankfully tries to give as much context as it can, but it's a build system. It's not an end-to-end -end dependency management solution. So it, it most it does is tell you, I can't find this particular kind of CMake file I was looking for, and there's this keyword that you used, and I'm gonna give it back to you. Maybe it means something to you which it doesn't, again, if you're starting out as a new engineer. So what would we like to see? Just talk about libraries, right? Like, I can't find the JSON log library. I can't find, it's not listed as a build dependency. Like, it seems to conflict with this other thing you're using. I can and give you more details about like, what the conflicts seem to be. You wanna see, like, I, I was trying to include this header file, and I don't even know if it goes to a library or an executable or what, like, it's, it seems like just this floating dot h file, I don't know what to do with it. Like, like that would be great, right? Or ideally, in the right context, something just fixes it. If we have that kind of metadata, that becomes possible. So I'm gonna reference JSON log throughout this talk a little bit, just because I thought it's a nice, simple use case to explain why we need dependency management. I think other languages, there might actually be a few packages, unsurprisingly. As far as I know, there's no C++ one. If there is, uh, I guess you got a free, free plug. Congratulations, uh, check it out. Um, so why don't these tools just fix it? Like, get good, give me a good error message. Enough said, right? But it, these tools have limited context. Linkers know about symbols. Like, like preprocessors know about textual inclusion. Build systems know about dependency, like dependency management as far as like task executions and timestamps file, on files in the file system. Like, these things can't give you the full error message. They can't say this library is missing because we don't know what a library is. There, it doesn't exist. So these fuzzy responsibilities mean these tools try to step into each other's business a little bit more to try to help you out. And that actually makes it even harder tools to, to design because those interoperability layers are very fuzzy. So we all come up with our coping strategies for that, including just remembering if you see this weird error message, it means you might have to go look and see maybe you didn't install the build dependency correctly. And but those strategies are not portable across communities. They're not portable across projects. They're not portable between each, between each other. Like it's really hard to, to, have to take that learned knowledge and share with people. We don't see, that's why these tooling, 
talks don't tend to be as end-to-end -end as you might expect. So another consequence of all this is we actually see stagnation in some of the tools. I'm gonna call out build systems specifically because it's something we're talking about today, but like they try to, again, they try to like get into dependency management a bit. Um, maybe that's not, a, maybe that's fine. Maybe it's a build system slash dependency management, management hybrid system, but even like within that, like where's the boundary between that, those parts of the code in that design, right? Um, these things become too complex to disrupt. I see so many great ideas about build systems, but I'm always a little like pessimistic about the opportunities for those people that want to start those projects up because there's no clear place to plug in and say, oh, I'll get, I'll get between this point and this point in our, in our tooling stack because it's all blurring together and kind of running together, right? And that means that every, even simple projects need very sophisticated build systems. Like if you just have a couple header files and a CPP file, you need CMake. All the things in CMake, because a lot of them are not optional, really. If you want to have a full, professional, modern uh, developer experience for yourself and the people you collaborate with. And that means that like, network effects are actually outweighing the, the real features that you might be wanting to push in your build system, right? Like you might not actually, like, you just use CMake because everyone's using CMake, and that's what you need. Your consumers are using CMake, so you use CMake, so everyone's talking in CMake. And that causes, like, how are you gonna get in, how are you gonna horn in on that action? I guess your, your tool needs to do at least what CMake does. That's a really big list of things, right? It also means the, the consequence of the bad dependency management is also an underdeveloped library ecosystem. I mean, quick, like the example I gave, in your head, think. If someone came to you and said, how do I log in a JSON format to a file? That's not a hard requirement, is it? But like, how would you do it? Like immediately you're reaching for, reaching for dependencies, and as I've covered, that's already a complicated thing in C++. Or maybe you're writing all that from scratch, and how wise is that? JSON, like even just getting the Unicode right on JSON, it kind of scares me a little bit, right? So, and why don't we see more of these talks at CppCon? I would love to see more of these talks. Like, hey, here's my JSON C++ uh, logging library, but like we kind of need better ecosystem around that to make that an easier thing to sell. Hey, go back, to your, go back to your desk when you get to work, install it, try it out. Like, we're not quite there yet, right? And that puts a lot of pressure on the standard library. One thing you might have thought about logging or JSON, maybe parts of it are like, maybe we should just have a pound include JSON in the standard library. And maybe we should. But shouldn't we have like a really subtle piece of tech that everyone thinks is really boring before we approach that point? Shouldn't we already feel like there's, we have already ironed out all the mistakes before we talk about making it permanent and immutable for the rest of time? If you want to hear more about that point, Bryce Lelbach has a fantastic talk about the standard library, how they decide what goes in it, into it, and how it's, these kinds of challenges arise because of, because of uh, you know, people having conflicting like, goals and stuff. He specifically points out uh, the package metadata format is a big opportunity to maybe take that pressure off the standard library. So I think if you care about the standard library and who doesn't, this is something you should be really interested in. Um, if you want to hear more about this whole talk and the justification for package management, my colleague Daniel Russo and I gave a full-length full talk at C++ Now 2022 called Searching for Convergence in C++ Package Management, where we basically lay out this case in more detail. By the way, a lot of credit to Daniel Russo. Like, we team up on all kinds of stuff. He does a lot of fantastic work. He has a lot of great papers in this. Um, you can look him up. He has a lot of great content in this space if you're interested. So that's the verdict. Like, I think you all t are telling everybody, somebody needs to do something about this. Hey, I'm somebody. Let's do something, right? So disclaimer, like, obligatory disclaimer with a new project. We're not at 1.0 yet. We're gonna, make, we're gonna learn things as we go. But you know, this is why we're having this talk. We want you to understand that we're starting. We want to invite you to participate as we develop this in the, in the directions it needs to go. There's a lot of edge cases. I'm not going to see your edge case necessarily if you're not talking to me about it. As part of our plan, we want Bloomberg and its code base to be part of the early adoption plan. Um, Bloomberg already has a lot of packaging metadata solutions, specifically hinging on package uh, config um, as a technology, I'm not going to explain it in a lot of detail, but it does provide kind of the same information in a kind of awkward way. Um, not all the things we, and it's not as actively, as actively developed as I would like for this kinds of a very um, high growth kind of tech project, so it makes more sense to start a new one in this case. Um, but, we, but Bloomberg doesn't need a Bloomberg config. We want to use the same stuff you do. We have a very large code base. We have over 30,000 C++ projects with a Debian-based package manage management solution. We have over half a billion lines of code just in C and C++. I'm not even getting into the other, like we have a ton of Python and J JavaScript, probably just as much as C++. 
Um, but we don't want to, like, a lot of those pa packages are the same ones you use. I mean, we use FMT, right? We use protobuf. Like, it's the same stuff you use. In fact, we use the same build system it ships with. So when I, when I run make or CMake on those projects, it looks a lot like the make or CMake you're running. So I want those all to be the same, because I don't want to have to reinvent, relearn the lessons you learned while you were trying to work on those projects, right? That's expensive for Bloomberg. So let's team up on this and, keep, and drive these costs down and the interoperability up, right? If you want to learn more about package config and its limitations, Ben Bakel, who works at Kitware with Bill, is, uh, is, 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 is again, world-renowned expert on like, this kind of stuff. He wrote a full ISO paper called P number P2800. Um, if you know, the, you know, there's a link to a non-ISO place that is where it's published right now, but it'll be on ISO, uh, the ISO archives pretty quick. Um, it's called Dependency Soup Needs Some Fiber, which is, I like that, that's cute. Um, He's also, I think, assistant chair in the, the, the tooling data group. I think that's the right job title. Um, if you want to more, know, know about, more about the Bloomberg packaging story, um, Daniel Russo and I gave a talk at, here at CPPCon 2021 called Lessons Learned from Packaging Over 10,000 C++ Projects. We talk a lot more detail about our Debian and our package config and our workflows and stuff and our integration build. Um, so if you want to know, like, like how is the early adoption going to look? This might give you a lot of good clues on that. Um, so what are, we, what are we talking about, like very specifically as in a specification? Turns out we already have a draft of one. This is a project that Matthew Wilkie has been working on for years. A lot of credit goes out to Matthew for being, having the foresight and the attention to detail to go to the effort of actually, actually making a specification for this in the hopes that we all catch up to him. Um, and that's what we're kind of proposing here is that we do, we do a bit of that. The, he did pr present a paper to ISO, P1313. It's an easy number to remember. You can go look that up where he talks, he, go, he goes through justification and things like that too. Um, and important to all this, I mentioned adoption friction. We want to make sure that like, we get somewhere in a reasonable amount of time. I don't, I'm not going to be satisfied if this takes 20 years. Like, we got to go a lot faster than that. So uh, we ex we're going to ship these, this upgrade, the CPS files, through CMake by making this the new flavor of CMake. So it's like we are, we are already doing modern CMake, right? So I guess it's the new postmodern CMake? I don't know. Like you, you'll tell me, hit me up in the comments section, and come up with good names for this. But we want to replace the CMake syntax we use to communicate across CMake projects with something that's more accessible, just JSON, right? But that, that whole, I got a thumbs up already. I like that, great. Um, we want, uh, we want this to be trivially adoptable for current CMake users. It is a plurality, probably the majority of publicly available source code supports CMake in some way. Um, we want them to have a very smooth, ideally only upgrading CMake transition pro process to get to this new metadata. Of course, they'll be like, we'll probably have to have some combination of both for at least a while, but the goal is as soon as possible to see these JSON files available for all projects to use normal supported CMake workflows. And that means it should also work with existing package managers. That means the, the package managers that you're already using, Debian, you know, Pacman, Conan, Conan 2.0, VC package, Homebrew, they should all basically work as, to the extent that there's already CMake being used in those projects. And in the cases where CMake's not being used in these projects, they're just JSON files. So we can probably, it's, it's very reasonable to say, um, you can come up with some custom rules to export one more file or a couple more files to describe your project. Again, it's, you're just declaring what's already in your project. So this isn't like you're inventing new things, you're mostly describing what's already there, right? And the good news is like JSON's such a commoditized piece of tech at this point, you could just you know, run JQ and a bash script and that's your build system if you really wanted to. Please don't, but I mean, you could. Let's do it now, we're ready, right? And how, how, do I, how am I so confident when I say that? One, dependency modules need dependency, C++ modules need dependency metadata. Um, Luis Cato Campos gave a fantastic talk, by the way, also very much an expert in this space, um, where he's, to, uh, like yesterday at CPPCon 2023, where he, among the things he pointed out was that, like, we, you know, we don't, you can't really do header only anymore, right? Like not, like, not with modules, there's no like module only interface, at least nobody has developed the tech to make that work. Um, so the, there's other the reasons why you really need some metadata about how to parse your module interface while you're shipping it. It means you can't just sh throw the files around anymore. You have to also pair it with structured data about how, what those files mean and how you can incorporate that into your build system. That makes for awkward design, and that makes this for awkward designs for shipping modules. Okay, clearly we need some like standard metadata and we're working on that. For like, how do, how do you understand what a module is? But where do you put it? 
Like, we don't even know what a library is. Like, there's no definition for what a library is, right? So how do you say the library has metadata? You can't, because the library is not a thing, right? So this is gonna be that. This is gonna be the library. Um, and we definitely don't want people choosing de between dependencies and build systems. So I'm talk I, I think a lot about systemic effects of how code evolves, and this is a big risk in the module space. If we get, right now, by the way, so good news, uh, modules are maturing really well, I think, at this point. Bloomberg's been sponsoring a lot of kit. We're working this space, by the way, because we, we believe that we should see that happening. Um, the, like, if you're in a monorepo kind of workflow, or if you're doing in a pretty reasonable sized project, and very, very soon, as in maybe, perhaps even the next CMake release, hopefully with, you know, it's, it's quality enough that you, we, we don't have to say reservations about bugs or something, like, you're gonna be able to do this in CMake projects where it's one CMake project like with ads, with subdirectories or maybe fetch content type workflows. If, if, if you're in CMake, you know what I'm talking about. Um, but it's, it's a, if that's how as far as it gets, that's a problem. Because a lot of people aren't doing that stuff. And if a library, so the library authors have to think, well, do I even do C++ modules if, this, if, if I can't support, you know, Bazel users? Or, you know, like, or, or if the metadata doesn't translate? What happens if a library decides to go modular? Does everyone else have to pin to the old version and now we have like a fork? Is it like a Python 2, 3 situation but for that library? That's a big problem, right? So we, we really need to figure this out for modules alone. Um, there's also a lot of like inertia for this. I think there's a lot less though and I'm gonna try to explain a bit why. Um, dependency management's kind of in a local maxima to some degree. Like we're all shipping code. There's, there's incredible amounts of value out there written in C and C++. Like, the, world's, the world of software runs on C and C++. It's not even a question, right? So we solve these problems. But we don't solve them in ways that we can share, right? Not, not entirely. We can kind of learn lessons as engineers, but the technology doesn't translate. So like large organizations, maybe they have their own, they invented their own build system, and quite a few build systems came out of large organizations open sourcing the things they've done internally. Small organizations kind of muscle through, maybe they get one or two gurus, they just kind of hack it out when it gets really bad. Um, but, the, uh, but reasonably, it sounds like a lot of work to get out of this local, local maximum, out of a local maximum, right? It's, it sounds like that's going to be a lot of work. And, and I, I don't want to get started. I'm, I'm writing C++. I'm not writing CMake. I'm not writing uh, package scripts and stuff like that. So I understand. That's why I've already been emphasizing, I'm going to continue to emphasize that one of the key requirements for all of this is adoption velocity and, and reducing adoption friction. And if you wanna hear me talk about this for a lot longer, it's 90 minutes, but only 45 minutes if you watch it at double speed. Um, it's called Requirements for C++ Successor Languages. That was this year at C++ Now, um, where I talk uh, in the context of the languages that are competing with C++ right now and how adoptable they are, or maybe how, uh, how, how irreplaceable C++ is and maybe not always a good way. Um, but I do call it specifically in this talk that switching package managers is very expensive because the, the topological nature of having to go bottom to top through your dependencies. And we need to avoid that in this case, which is why we're, adopt, we're, why we're optimizing for quick, fast adoption. So let's, 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 let's take a step back. Let's talk to all of you that are like packaging, boo. I'm actually here just to kind of jeer and like some smirk because I like my, my, like, like my big uh, monorepo build system, right? Um, and that, that applies to like, you know, get some module users too. Anytime you're using source control or maybe even specific source packages to kind of version, to control the versions of your dependencies. I think there's still a lot for you here. And it might be enough that you even want to fund some of these projects. Um, there's standard ways, there are, that we need standard ways to work at the boundaries of these build systems. Even if you're in a monorepo, the bottom of your stack is a system that has libraries installed that you did not build. I promise you. If you have an exception, come talk to me, and you might be the only one. Like, they just, like everyone has them. It's, this, it's the library that help, help lets you interact with the kernel. It's the library that provides the localization. It's the library that provides the security features that you need to upgrade without having to rebuild your entire monorepo because it's an emergency. Those libraries need, need descriptions too. And there's a ton of value around the world if we can get those things described, even if you feel, well, I can just build everything from source. There's a lot of tools for these people to use that are not inside their build systems. Like you, like you can run clang tidy with the compiler commands JSON, you don't need a build system for that, right? But Compiler Explorer, raise your hand if you like Compiler Explorer. Yeah, right, Did you, raise your hand if you knew Compiler Explorer can, can manage some dependencies for you. 
Yeah, quite a few, a lot fewer hands. It tries. Actually, you can go in there, you can click around, you can say, I want FMT installed, and I'm going to use those headers, and I'm going to see some examples. But it just kind of makes stuff up in the implementation, because there's no standard for this. And it's a good implementation, given that. But we can do better, right? Let's make it easy on the Compiler Explorer maintainers, so that you can just like, like have all the dependencies. Why not? I could just call Conan behind the scenes for you or something. But that's not a thing that they can do yet, because we, we need to help them, right? And so if you're in a monorepo, that sounds great, doesn't it? Host, um, and I already mentioned host machines having pre-built pre dependencies. And I just think there's a lot of like, ecosystem benefits that we're going to see out of this. Like names will start being more coherent. Standards will start being established about like, boundaries between projects, that sort of thing. Um, another problem we have is just low expectations. I think the biggest hurdle I have when I talk to people about this in the hallway is just people being, like, understandably, just a little tired. Um, like, like, I don't think we're ever going to get somewhere, somewhere here. So. Um, if my enthusiasm isn't getting you there, uh, I have some points that are a little more concrete. Uh, let's, let's back up. So, like, when I say low, low expectations, I mean stuff like this. Like, we're not there, people not using package managing, managers at all, or even in even coherent dependency management systems, right? Like, for example, using what I call unpackaged dependencies. You're just copying source code around, right? Um, in particular, like the popularity of, of header-only libraries is a little concerning to me. Um, I think uh, Luis Cato Campos in his talk was saying something like, I think 25% of Conan packages are header only, which is really high. I'm getting nods, so yes. Um, so let, let's go point by point through this. So not using existing package managers. That's actually not entirely true. We're seeing a lot of growth in the package management adoption. I'm probably gonna get nods from the package managing people about that too. Um, but I think these standards will actually accelerate that. Like if, it's, if you can enroll in a package manager instead of port, to the package manager, that's a very compelling difference in, wor in wording, isn't it? We want, we want it, uh, for people using unpackaged dependencies, that's already a really big problem. Um, we've, we've already been talking this week about security and safety and how it's becoming more important for, for C and C++. A lot of you may not realize that because of our, uh, our ecosystem, it makes it very, very hard for end users to detect these kinds of problems in our code bases. A lot of, if you're copying a header file into your library, does that metadata show up in a software bill of materials? I'll get into that in a minute, what that means. The answer is probably not, unless you're very, very meticulous and paying attention to detail. And in certain industries, they are that meticulous. But a lot of industries, you're not. And that's a problem. And, and we actually do have higher expectations, just not for this, right? Like, Python is, is C++'s second favorite language, right, according to the polling I've seen. And you all would not use a non-PyPI published library in, our, in production, would you? You'd like at least like take it and adopt it and review it as your own code in some way, assuming the license is compliant. But you wouldn't be like, oh, I just found some Python files and I just copied it in my repo and this is good. Like you'd be like using Python package and dependency management, right? Or even if you had a monorepo, again, you'd be like using monorepo style tools to manage those dependencies, but they'd still be in the Python package index. So you have those higher expectations. Use them here. And for header-only libraries, again, I don't know if this is gonna survive the transition to, to, to modules. I don't see module only working. Um, and uh, I already mentioned there's some security issues with that sort of thing. And, and beyond all that, like, how does a header-only library depend on a header-only library, on another header-only library? You just include things and hope somebody figures it out? That doesn't scale, right? Like, if you need that logging library to be at the bottom of your stack, and you need everything up to an HTTP server with, secure, with uh, you know, encryption and stuff, like, well, how's that header-only library? It's not, because we don't have it, right? Let's talk a little bit about CPS and how we think it'll work with software bill of materials. Again, software bills of materials are ways to ensure transparency of software products. Um, they, they use to manage especially open source and third party dependencies, but they, they have ways to support uh, proprietary dependencies as well. Um, the, you use them to, they're kind of like the, uh, you know, the, ingredient, the nutritional information on the side of the, pro the products you might buy in a grocery store. It's like, this is what's in here, here's the ingredients. Um, and it tells you a lot of things. Like if you're allergic to peanuts, that's really important to know. And I'm allergic to security bugs. I don't know about you, right? So this is a really easy thing for people to fund. I've been nerd sniping people in the hallways that are in this space. I think this is a really right place for someone with entrepreneurial spirit, spirit to go to governments, to go to regulatory agencies, to get funds to say, I can improve C++ packaging. You can find C++ bugs. Give me some money. We're going to get packaging better, right? There's another problem, historically, um, that this is not in scope for ISO, the, the Standardization Committee for C++. I didn't understand that. Two years ago, I came to CPPCon, 
I was asking questions about like, hey, what all tooling stuff should we do? Because I like tooling. Um, Daniel Russo was asking like, hey, why, why don't we have package management stuff? Why aren't we working on that? And the answers we got back were, well, the ISO C++ is a spec of a syntax, of a language, right? It's not a, uh, it's, it, it doesn't really even deal with files too much. It's just literally the text you would see in the, con the editor window in your compiler explorer instance, right? But not anymore. Like we, we've taken some polling in the, the ISO study group this time, around this time last year, about like, should we actually get into the ecosystem business? And it was an incredible poll. Anyone that goes to ICE will tell you that the, the consensus that, consensus is a term of art, so the, the, the poll passed very strongly, right? Incredibly strongly. Like, like never one's ever seen a poll that high in that direction. We had one neutral. We didn't have anyone against it. Like you always get a couple people against it for procedural reasons or something. But like we got one neutral, that was the only the bad thing, the, the only one that wasn't even for this, this whole thing. So I'm gonna take a little experiment, All right? I'm gonna ask you to raise your hands Raise your hands if you can hear me. So this is scientific, there's the control, okay. Right, right. No, raise your hands if you like puppies. All right, okay, raise your hands if you like kittens. All right, that's about the ratio we got in the poll from the ISA meeting. So we officially, package management is as popular puppy and kid, as puppies and kittens with C++ engineers. <laughs> Put it in the slides next year. We've solved that problem. So, now that we've solved that problem, let's talk about more problems we're gonna solve. Bill's gonna talk about the concepts uh, behind this whole dependency management system and how uh, this really is part of the natural outgrowth of how CMake has been developing over the years. Well, thanks, Brett. Um, I'm really excited to be here. I think, uh, you know, thinking back to starting CMake, I was a young developer. Um, and had the audacity to think I could create something that would be useful for, for everyone. But really, it was a, a long uh, journey of just dogged pragmatism. <laughs> so what are we talking about here? A library. What's a library? Can anybody tell me what a library is? Well, today, I think a library is a whole bunch of things. It's a, it could be a set of header files. could be a set of C++ files. The binary and static libraries, module interface units, a whole bunch of things. Um, over on the right there, I've got um, on my uh, Mac, you can see SPD log. It's got some uh, couple libraries there and then a bunch of header files. But they aren't together. They, you know, they happen to be like the include directory and the lib directory right next to each other. But there's nothing tying these things together. Um, and another use case is a meta library. So it does absolutely nothing but depend on the library. You might use this, let's say you want to refactor some library and it turns into two libraries. So you call it you know, A and then in the future A links to C and B, um, but you can maintain that interface through the use of a meta library. So in the future, this bright future that Brett and I are seeing and, and working on, What's a library? Open up your CPS file. That's what your library is going to be. So how many hands think that's better than the first case? Almost as many people as like puppies. <laughs> so in C++, dependency management is implicitly required. Um, but it's not there in any structured way. Um, Right now, you can uh, create ill-defined programs um, through incoherent dependencies. Um, all the symbols and objects linked together have to be consistent enough to work together. And there's not really good ways to detect these incoherencies. No specific ways to deal with redundant symbols. So let's, let's look at how a, a typical build system interrupts with a dependency manager. So think something like RPM. So I go and I do my build of the awesome JSON log library, the mythical JSON log library. And I build that and I get some binaries and I get my header files. And now I get this cool CPS file that describes what that whole package is. I copy that into the installation location and then when I go to actually build my Fangorn application, 
the build system, whatever it happens to be, can load that CPS file and know how to use JSON log CPS. Now this is gonna require some consistent naming. So maybe we need to do identifier standardization, just like in C and C++. We don't want spaces in the names, probably. We wanna prevent name collision. How are we gonna do that? I'm sure there's gonna be lots of uh, libraries called you know, job build, utility, et cetera. Do we have some sort of name registry? Now these, these are open for discussion. We're probably gonna need this stuff, some sort of namespaces. But what we want is that we do have consistent naming across the ecosystem. So let's not have a different way of asking for the SSL library. Let's just all call it SSL everywhere. You may ask yourself, how did we get here? So I'm gonna go through a little bit of history. So when I started programming with C and C++ in the 90s, there was auto tools. And I remember learning about it, I'm like, this thing's pretty cool. You know, it, look at that, it can find these libraries on the disk and I can find something that someone else built and use it in my makeflow. That's a pretty cool innovation. But let's take this apart a little bit. So there's a call here that looks for a header file, zlib.h, and then there's a call that looks for a library called z and it prints a nice error message that says, hey, you know, install this over here. But these are two separate calls. How do I know that it found zlib.h that went with the z I found? I don't, because they aren't packaged together. They're sitting separate on the disk, just isolated in their own little world, right? So wouldn't it be better if we could just say, find the library libz, and that had everything you needed to use that library, and it was a coherent package. So let's look at CMake. CMake has had a, a long history. It's been around a long time. And when I first created it, it was basically for a, a single project, but I had hopes that it would grow beyond that. But it had to work from day one. So I got something together, and it worked a lot like Makefiles did. But the big innovation I had is it worked on Windows, Linux, and Mac. It worked across platforms. You know, it, it copied a lot of the same problems that other build systems had in the day and what make files. The original CMake didn't have transitive linking. So you had to, every time you linked an executable, you had to list all the libraries that it depended on. And it didn't matter if you, this library depended on this one and that one, I had to list those all the time. So people would copy around these lists of libraries and variables and if you wanted to link statically, you probably had to repeat them three or four times to actually get the darn thing to link. Um, and I remember people saying, you know, why doesn't this CMake thing, you know, it, it's kind of, it's defining the library. It knows this library uses that library because you're linking shared. Why do I have to repeat this stuff? Can't CMake just figure that out? Like, yeah, I guess it could. And eventually that innovation came along. And we had transitive linking in CMake. It's awesome. You know, it was a huge innovation, it was great. It made people's lives better, and that's, that's really what, it, what it's about, you know, trying to evolve that. But then people said, well, what about the flags? The minus I flags, the minus D flags, the compiler flags, what about those? I mean, you, you pulled the libraries along, but I can't really use them because I need to have all these flags. What about those? And after a while, you know, through community uh, involvement in CMake and the growing community and people really looking at like, this problem really should be solved. Modern CMake was created and got away from this sort of this flag soup um, that Ben Bakel talks about, um, where you can have problems. So if you break it down sort of into a minus capital L and a minus little l, that causes problems. There's actually code in CMake going way back to early CMake before we had modern CMake that would look at your minus capital L directories and scan them and look to see if your minus little L libraries that you're looking for showed up in more than one 
directory that you're asking CMake to look in. And CMake would just give you a warning. Like, hey, there's two libzs that happen to show up in your capital L paths. You might want to look at that. I might pick the wrong one. Who knows? So <coughs> this evolution, um, the target is sort of at the heart of modern CMake. So when I create a library, my math function, and then I say I've got a public compile definition. So that means whenever you want to link to math functions, I want a minus D flag that says my math function required flag. And then I have an executable and I just link to math functions. And then you can see down on the bottom when I do my build that that minus D flag shows up when I'm building tutorial.cxx, but I never asked that. All I said was it links to this library. And then you can see it pulled in this math functions.a that I also didn't directly link. So the core of this is that a library is treated the same, whether it's built-in source, think big mono repos, or if it's found um, pre-built somewhere else. So I can either do add library bar, or I can say find package bar. But in my code, I just say target link libraries foo to bar. And it makes no difference which bar I'm getting. It could have been built, or it could have been pre-built. So this is awesome stuff. So looking into CMake a little more, there's a modules directory. And inside there, if you do an ls, there are 179 files called findsomething.cmake. And this is sort of CMake's poor man's package manager um, in an attempt basically to make things easier, right? Solving that problem, right? Because there wasn't a problem, there wasn't a solution out there. But we needed to solve this problem, right? I want to I want to find WX Windows, and I want to use it. So I wrote a find WX Windows thing, and it sort of searched around on the disk and tried to find WX Windows, and it did its thing. But what can we learn from this find star.cmake? Well, the original find.cmake files look for includes in libraries, a lot like that autocom, auto tools file I showed you in the beginning. Um, it would find some .hs, some .as, dot SOs and dot libs, stuff them into some variables, and then basically you kind of had that flag soup thing. Um, headers might not go with libraries, libraries might be found in multiple minus L locations, but the really big problem and sort of the holy grail of this and the problem that really, it was a head scratcher. How am I gonna solve this? The fine stuff really shouldn't ship with CMake, right? When a new version of WX Windows comes out, that might break the fine WX windows that came with CMake. And who knows, that CMake might be two or three years old because it's sitting around from your package manager on your um, Linux distribution. And then it's not gonna work at all with the, the current version. So what we really want and need is that these files somehow have to ship with the thing that's built. Because the person that's building it and setting that up is the one that knows how to use it. And they need to be able to communicate that information to the consumer of that library. And right now, that communication path is broken. There's no, no way for them to talk. There's no cell service. So I thought it would be cool if we walked through Find Cute in CMake. And it's had many iterations, and it follows this path. So if we look at the original Find Cute 3 in CMake, Essentially, it searched on the disk, and it provided these variables. Cute include dir, where do I find the .h files? Cute libraries, a list of libraries that I need to link to. Cute definitions, there's my minus D flags. A little flag to tell you whether it's found or not. Some version string. Um, some other stuff in there. But essentially, this was that same problem. You know, it could find mismatched parts of Qt. There's all kinds of issues with this. Find Qt 4. This was actually an innovation. We're moving forward in time. 
And what this did is it actually found the QMake program, which is the build tool for Qt, and queried it and said, hey, where did you put all your libraries? Where is everything? And then it created uh, imported targets for CMake. So this was a concept that came into CMake essentially to support cross-compiling um, because we had packages that we wanted to build for the host and the target system. But sometimes, like when you're building a library, especially our, our VTK library had a, a code generator in it. And you, you had to, like, as you were building VTK, you'd build this code generator. And then you had to run the code generator to generate the, the Python bindings for VTK. But if you're cross-compiling it for some uh, HPC system, you know, the big supercomputer, you had to do two different build trees. You know, one was just on the host system, and you'd build the host stuff, but then I wanted to be able to import all those targets that I needed, like executables and stuff that I built, and make them look like they were built for on, on my target system. So CMake created these imported targets um, from FineCube 4. And then let's look at FineCube 5. Wait, it doesn't exist. So this is really awesome. So this is that, that step, that innovation, that solving the problem of 179 fine star whatevers in CMake. This is really the, the answer, right? What Qt did is they taught their build system to create .CMake files that created targets that CMake could consume. Getting back to that modern CMake thing. So this is a really great innovation. And then find Qt 6, obviously it does not exist. But what happened here, even more exciting for me, was that Qt adopted CMake as its build tool and started using the native CMake export targets. But to do that, Qt had to undergo a major build system conversion for this to happen, for them to be really compatible with, with the ecosystem. Um, this find package, this documentation comes from the Qt page. It's not in CMake, right? If we go way back to find Qt 3, CMake had the documentation on how to use Qt from CMake. Now they can provide that here. So everything's perfect, right? Um, as Bryce, uh, Bryce said um, in his C++ Now talk, you've got a standard build system. It's called CMake. Resistance is futile. <laughs> I don't know if I like being compared to the board, but you know, whatever. <laughs> um, but you know, not everything's built with CMake, and that's not the answer, right? I mean, I, I love world domination, that was the plan, but it's not the answer, and it's not the answer going forward. There's gonna be other build tools, there's other systems, and even if CMake did take over and build every last line of C++ code in the world, CMake's not the only tool that needs to care about these libraries, right? .CMake files are hard to read and write if you're not CMake. There's other tools that care about this, package managers. So I think the answer is, and has been, sitting around, right under our noses, uh, Matthew Wolke, one of the engineers at Kitware, um, talked about this, and we've been talking about it at Kitware, and again, it's, you know, due to our business model, it's not like, yes, this is the way to go forward. You know, we had to find partners to work with. We've been really fortunate to work with Brett at Bloomberg, and it's, it's an awesome partnership. Um, but, you know, I think that the answer here has been sort of sitting underneath our noses for, since 2016. You know, and it's not, it's not complicated stuff. Um, so there was a 2018 paper, the C++ Now talk by Brett and Daniel you should check out. Um, last year at CppCon, there was sort of a hallway track with Brett and myself and Conan and VC package developers and others. Um, and this year, there's, I'd say, three talks about this um, at CppCon. So CMake and CPS. So right now, CMake's package files are created by CMake and commonly installed alongside libraries on Mac, Linux, Windows. CMake can be made to create these CPS files. So you can take the 
the market share that we have and turn it to something good. They may even, you know, innovate other build systems to take over CMake sometime in the future. Who knows? But really, the, the world of C++ really needs this. I don't want vendor lock-in. I want to expand the ecosystem. That's always better to make things better. CMake projects, we can make them to transition from CPS for free. I'm sure there'll be some pain. Um, we've got a lot to figure out. You know, hopefully we can figure out a way that makes it as easy as possible. But I think, you know, how many people would be happy if CMake created .cps files instead of .cmake files when you export a target? Smart. All right, that's almost the same as puppies, so we're doing it. <laughs> I think that was equal to puppies. Well, so let, let's look. So right now I, I pulled up on my, my machine and, uh, did a find for uh, .cmake files, and you can see that uh, FMT and SPD log create all these .cmake files, and this is, this is awesome, right? This is sort of one of the goals I had with, with creating this. One of the goals the other CMake developers had was to have this, the packages describing how to use themselves and relaying that information to the consumers in the future. So let's take a look. We, did, we put together a really simple, less than 1.0 version. So we, inside our uh, demo here, we created some handcrafted CPS files and we used the, the installed libraries from the package manager of the systems. We did a Fedora and a Mac OS um, for format and SPD log. So if we take a look inside these files, Lots of stuff here. I'll, I'll just pull out the stuff that's highlighted in a different color, the, the non-green stuff. Um, we can see that SPD log requires FMT. We can also see that to use SPD log, I want a couple of minus D flags to come along with it. Um, I can see there's also a variant here that's uh, header only. And over in our uh, release file, CPS file, I can see there's the path to the library with a nice at prefix because this thing has to be relocatable. You want to move it around. Finding CPS files, we're going to have to figure out how to find them. You know, just having them doesn't fix everything. There's good, some work here. Um, CMake's got a long history of this. Um, and we may not avoid those errors that Brett showed in the beginning of, you know, hey, I can't find this. But at least it'll be, I can't find this library. You should install it. So in the future, when I install FMT and SPD log, hopefully I see something like this. Maybe we should do like a, a poll or something to see what year we think we'd see this. <laughs> so let's write some C++ code, right? We're at a C++ conference. We should write C++ code. So I've got a really simple uh, program here. We include SPD log.h. Um, we set some level, and we print the famous hello world with some pound-defined code. So let's write some CMake code. Right now, we, uh, in this demo version 0.1, um, we wrote a load package function. In the future, this will be part of CMake's find package. But in this particular instance, we do load package, we give a full path to the CPS file, and we give the prefix so we can find the library and do that at, at, at variable expansion that we saw. But let's assume we did find package. We have our nice add executable here. Um, we can do variants, um, default components. So it has the concept of linking to a default version. So I'm just saying target link libraries, SPD log. Or if I don't want to use default components, I can go down and use subcomponents or something else. I run my configure. Everything works fine. Don't get any errors. And then I build it. And we build it verbose, and then we can see that those flags got pulled out of that CPS file. So we saw that communication path from the person who wrote FMT and SPD log, built them and installed them on some system, and then me as the consumer of that, I've got this information. That communication path is open through this simple JSON file. And I know how to link to those libraries, and everything works. I run it. Ta-da, 
and print it out. Fantastic, right? You can try it yourself. Um, on uh, Kitler's, Kitler's uh, GitLab instance, there's Mahmoud Volke, he's got a CPS demo, and he's also got a fork of CMake. And so another, another thing, uh, there, there's links to that at the end. So C++ modules are really gonna need this because you're gonna have to compile sometimes those BMI files because they aren't portable, right? If I'm installing a binary, I'm gonna have to install some C++ code that needs to be compiled to create the binary interface files. So this is just a, a straw man. We're gonna have some module in, information tag and it's gonna point to some file that describes our modules. And we're working on this. So going forward, CPS plans. Really what I want is, and what Brett wants, is to build a community. And we want package man maintainers, VC package, Conan, Conda, Spec, others, build system maintainers, other build systems. We'd love it for that to be adopted there, right? This, this should be the way that C++ describes a library. We want to involve the core CMake developers, tool chain and OS developers. You, 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 all of you. <laughs> Anyone that's interested, you know, we wanna share um, and confirm consensus um, with public ISO papers in the C++ tooling study group. So what are our plans now? We're gonna continue with this minimal viable plan in CMake, pro minimal viable product. Um, we're gonna add C++ 20 module support. We're gonna implement the uh, import. We're gonna teach find package to find CPS files. We're gonna explore use cases inside Bloomberg. Bloomberg's an awesome environment for this. They've got 10,000 C++ projects building with CMake. They've got a whole bunch of package config files. If we can get it to work there, it's gonna work for all of you as well. Um, but, but maybe not, right? And that's why people need to get involved, right? We don't, we wanna to code to the world, right? We want everyone to be able to use this. We wanna develop a transition plan that gradually supports moving from .cmake to .cps. How do we live with both? How do we work? All right, you know, one of the things giving this talk, this isn't really complicated stuff and we're talking about creating a JSON file that describes a few, a few files on disk. You know, it's not brain surgery, it's not rocket science, but what I've seen, you know, sitting there in, in the booth with CMake, people come up like, wow, CMake's been awesome. It's allowed me to do this stuff. So I think if we do this right, it may help some future robotics programmer do a better brain surgery program or help Elon Musk get to Mars. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, it's not a complicated thing, but it's gonna solve complicated problems. So we wanted to use open source best practices. Practices. We want to do an open source project, um, have issues, PRs, public comments, et cetera. We want to do ISO C++ review and ratification. Um, you can look, we've got a GitHub account here where we're a GitHub project. You can join there, and, um, create issues, talk to us. Yeah, that's, that's a project for the ecosystem I, uh, standard itself. So if we wanted to talk about like what goes in the ecosystem or not, including these things, that's where those kinds of issues would be tracked. Go ahead. Thanks, Brett. Um, so we've got uh, some key resources. CPS has some reference docs um, rendered on GitHub IO you can check out. The CPS project itself is on uh, GitHub. We've got the uh, demo repos that are very early on. There's a Slack channel that we've been discussing this on. So. Join the conversation, help us out. So future goals, you know, this, this technology should unlock better diagnostic for common, common errors, right? Because now we've defined these libraries, we can imagine tools that can proactively search around and detect mistakes. Like, you know, maybe your CPS file, you can go in there and look and like, oh, hey, these things actually aren't binary compatible, but you've, you're trying, you're, Build system can look at them and say, no, they aren't compatible, but you're trying to use them together. You know, and you can give an earlier warning rather than a seg fault or some weird compiler error um, or linker error. We can have explicit manifests of headers and modules. And this could unlock some really interesting tooling. 
Um, imagine, you know, we've all heard, how many people ever include what you use? People use that? It's an interesting tool. Wouldn't it be neat if you had link what you include? Right? So if I know what header files go with what libraries, and I've got sort of a modern CMake view, I can look through there, and I can use, you know, Clang to scan, and I can say, look, you're including these header files, but you're linking to this library, and none of its header files are in your direct dependencies. You're overlinking, right? We, can, we could detect things like that. We could have more accurate information for depending, dependency managers. You know, maybe we could, uh, you know, you could write something that uh, scrapes the metadata and does some interesting stuff for creating package managers, better data for dependency solvers. There's all kinds of things you could do with this. So with that, um, thank you, and we'll take questions, and I'll give Brett one more chance to make any final comments. No, oh, th thanks is it. Let's, uh, let's get to the questions. Um, let's start on the left. Oh, okay. Um, thanks. Uh, so I hear, I don't know a lot about those systems, um, which is why I wanted you all involved. Uh, but also, like, I hear a lot about declarative versus imperative build mm -hmm. systems and, and why declarative systems are the future. And so first of all, can you explain why there's people talking about that constantly no, think, or, or what the discussion is in, in a few words? And then secondly, can you talk about how this CPS format transition would interact with that? I know a lot of the pain points interacting with CMake at Google involve this differences between these differences between declarative and imperative or something like that. At least people tell me that. Maybe they're making excuses. I don't know. Right. Um, so the trade-off tends to be, uh, first of all, there are Turing complete declarative languages. So you can really do whatever you want in a declarative language. I've seen XML in the Java ecosystem that includes conditionals and loops and things like that. Um, I don't recommend it, but it's possible. Um, so we do discuss that, and it's still most, it's still, there's still a crack and there's a little bit of an opening that we might need to pivot and move to a more uh, procedural language to describe all the requirements we have. We'll want more concrete use cases before we make that pivot though. And we'll do another big talk or something to describe, okay, it turns out JSON's not good enough. We're gonna have to come up with a subset of Python or a Lisp or something for this. But we, we wanna have that full story together before we pivot that hard. Um, so it's a possibility. Um, the trade-off tends to be declarative is simpler and easier to introspect. So you all already understand, oh yeah, JSON, I can see fields, I get it, right? Like maybe you need to read a spec to understand how they relate to each other, but like what they can be, but like, that makes sense. With an, with an imperative language, like, or even a, like a functional language that's also like a script, of, a, a script of some sort, how do you get that info out? You probably need to define additional protocols of some sort where you can like run the program but pull information out of it. That actually exists already in CMake. CMake has fairly sophisticated introspection APIs, depending on what you're doing with, you talked about interrupt, depending on what those interrupt requirements are, that might be something to look at. But um, again, that's a more complicated API and we wanna keep this as simple and accessible as possible. Again, if we get to that point, like we want that full story before we make that pivot. So I'm gonna bounce to the right. Yep, uh, thanks. So I had a question about the kind of uh, not yet CMake library category. So um, I've got a library that we have an option to deliver it as a, a single header file, but to get the full install with different headers, um, it's currently Bazel only. Uh, and yes, by the way, it is one of those use this library talks whose absence you were lamenting, 2 p.m. today. Um, anyway, uh, we want to add CMake support, but like we don't know CMake, so the question is, can we jump straight to CPS to, to get the CMake support? Is that something we can do today? If not, is it something we can do like in the future? What are your thoughts? Um, no, I don't think you're gonna get, I mean, it might, it might be that if you build it, yeah, it's not gonna change the build system, but it's gonna allow, if you have a build, then it's easier to consume by the CMake build system. So if you built it with something else like Bazel, then maybe if Bazel was creating these files, it would be much easier for people to find it and consume it with CMake. So it might actually change the dynamics in that direction. So I guess, I guess, so you're kind of asking like, where are we on the roadmap a little bit? 
like I wouldn't use this today. If you want to be like jump in and help us design this so it works in your use cases, which we would very much like, then yes, like you could like write your own, you could enhance your Bazel build with extra like plugins and try to load CPS instead of hard coding the same flags in your Bazel config or whatever that is. If you have that flexible of a library, probably have some preprocessor stuff going on to kind of control which mode you're in and that kind of stuff. Like that kind of information is like getting passed around. There is a roadmap on the CMake side. I expect a, a, a certain amount of experimental mode for this, um, at least one release, although we haven't been super specific about the, that, at that level of the release plan. I would expect there to be, like we do for C++ modules right now, have some sort of like very explicit opt-in, like I want the experimental thing. Um, and then that's probably where a lot of the real lesson lear learn, learning lessons and, and things will happen. Um, at, once that hits a, once that kind of feature goes away, that's going to be a signal, at least as far as CMake goes, that yeah, if, if your project wants to deliver some CPS files, you can be confident that uh, it would be a bug if a downstream CMake project couldn't just use your CPS files and, and get the build they wanted, or, or at least a missing feature or something like that. Really Thank exciting you. future. Can't wait to live there. Thanks. Right, right on, man. On the, on the left here. Yeah. Yep. Thank you for the talk. So the bird might be a similar question to the previously asked, but from maybe a different angle. So you were previously in your previous talks, you also making the speed of, of the last of adoption. Mm -hmm. So how, what's your plan for all these libraries that aren't using other tools or somebody make files? So how do you consume that, assuming that their maintainers will not, well, are not willing to really bother with all this stuff? <laughs> right, exactly. Um, the plan is the plan we do for everything, um, which is like, currently this, this is actually a problem for package config workflows. Uh, like there's a lot of libraries that don't provide the package config metadata and the package maintainers do it for them. So I, I think if we standardize on this stuff, it'll become a better lever for the package maintainers to push back in the library maintainers a little bit and say, no, you really need to do a little bit of work here. It's not a lot, just describe your library a little bit. Um, so I think it'll help as an ecosystem, but initially it's going to be the same kind of work they do now, um, and at least in the, on the POSIX system side, where they might have this. P I, I got at a bullet point, I probably underemphasized it, but like we have .pc templated files, and then they'll use like a find replace program to like fill in the interesting blanks, and then that gets delivered with the library. I expect something very similar for CPS workflows. Um, again, like as we do better and better MVPs. Like, we'll, I'd expect some of that to happen. Like, we'll come out with an auto tools or make base system and show how that would work. Um, for the library authors that absolutely don't want this at all, I expect the package managers will definitely want this. And they'll come in and like, have to provide patches. And these are fairly easy patches to provide because usually you're just adding a couple files and maybe a little bit of a make file uh, line or something like that. Yeah, thank you. This makes sense. Well, actually, like, Conan already has infrastructure for that, uh, to kind of different generators. For instance, right. in my company, we have different libraries built with different build systems, but basically, with the help of Canon, we bridge it to the CMake. Right. So it'll be, uh, the second question, in your example, what's the purpose of at release CPS file? You have like library name CPS and library name at release CPS. Yeah, so that's a way of uh, encapsulating. There'd be a, like a release and a debug, um, and you could- It's like a configuration? Keep, yeah, being able to just keep the, uh, the different variants of builds separate from the main CPS file. Right. The requirement is we work with the code that exists. And there's a lot of code out there that has more than one flavor of a library that may be incompatible. In fact, a lot of you may not know this, but a lot of the standard libraries have, have modes and options that's, that can be set that will be incompatible with other modes and options on the same library. So if you, if you are constructing an application, you have to be consistent about that choice. And so that kind of information needs to be really shipped with the library, including the standard library, so people can make that choice. And if it includes a different binary, especially, you probably want two different files or something. That might pivot. That's one of those details we might revisit. But we'll definitely want on the file, in the files to describe like that kind of, a, that kind of an arrangement. Yeah. Thank you. Hey, um, yeah, first of all, thank you so much for doing this. So like, if, if this takes off, and I, I can't see a reason why it wouldn't, the impact of this is going to be so tremendous. It's going to change everything, really. So. It's really important work. Um, my question is, uh, Bill, you had on, on your slide when you were uh, doing the, the, uh, the finding for the SPD log, um, you mentioned that there uh, is this distinction that you, you could find the default version or uh, another version. You went over this quite quickly. So like, what is the default version there that you were finding and why, why, why do you have this distinction between the two versions? 
Okay, yeah, so that was uh, basically having a default component. So say you had some library like uh, I don't know, Qt or something like that. You might have a default, like, look, I just want to link to this Qt thing. So the, the default would, for example, be what, what comes with the system package manager? Like app no, 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 yeah. I mean like a default set of components. Oh, so if it's a componentized system, you know, I might want to just say, hey, look, I don't want to figure out what, what different options there are. I just want to link to this SPD log thing. Oh, God, I, don't, right. I don't care that, you know, but, or, you know, if I really only need some subset of it and I really know what I'm doing, I can pull in and get, right. get the component. Again, again, standard libraries do this in experimental modes, like they might add file system support with a separate binary. So you might have a, you might have a standard library with file system, like component. Right, but, the, but by default, maybe that's not the default. And it'll be up to the library, th this will give levers for the library maintainers and even the package managers to decide, well, what is the default? And that you should have a sensible default that's in the context of that link. Um, that it, like, because like, like, there's different applications. If you're, if you're a safety critical system, you want a different flavor of things and maybe your default's different. But these will give mechanisms to make these choices. Again, there's a lot of future work in this space about like, how do we how do we juggle all that? And, but right now we do it. We just do it the hard way. So, yeah. thanks. Right. Hello, fantastic talk. Really excited about the future. One of the things I've been thinking about is um, how CPS files may handle different variations of hardware. There's a ton of hardware out there, especially in the embedded space. There's a lot of different devices with a lot of different weird, different coprocessors. And I'm wondering, is there uh, has CPS kind of come up with a guys come up with a solution for how we handle all the different variations, especially when you make pre-built binaries? Yeah, there's existing experience in this space too. Again, um, like uh, it's pretty common for it's, these are these aren't as extreme of examples, but like in Debian packaging, they tend to use directories to describe like different kinds of architectures and stuff when you build those those artifacts. Again, the CPS is going to describe the binaries and the files, right? So if, if you have, let's say you have a header only library, you may only need the one CPS file that can work everywhere because it does, it's portable, right? But if you have a binary and it's built specifically in a way that works on some Linux systems and not others because of OS differences, maybe the kernel's different, you're going to need that information in, in the CPS file. So you're going to need more CPS files or at least more components, depending on how, where we end up on that, on that kind of a spectrum of choices to describe those kinds of things. And that might go to the uh, at release file, right? You might have a at this architecture, at this architecture, at that architecture, and be okay, able to yeah. compose those together into a single package and then choose which variants you want. Possibly, yeah. Gotcha, thank you. Yeah. Hi, my question is, um, how do the CPS files actually assist in making the SBOM? Is it related to the syntax being easier to drop into an SBOM, or do you have plans to kind of collate all of the items in the build? Yeah, that's a great question. Product? I'm hand waving a little bit, so bear with me. <laughs> but the idea is like, because we're declaring libraries, because we can include things like version information in those CPS files, even we could include things like um, uh, sign, signing information for those packages, original, original place of origin, we could link. Maybe there's an SBOM for that library that you can just reference from the, S, from the CPS file. So that like build systems and package managing systems can use that as a central point to go out and like find all the information they need to maybe build a higher level SBOM to describe what's going on in that build process. And if you're not in your head, you probably are in this space a little bit and you probably know this is all kind of opaque right now. And that's what I was trying to get at. Like the fact that we have something you can introspect opens up a lot of options. Now, again, the hand waving is, is why I was pointing out like, hey, this is a really right place to get some like entrepreneurial people in here and like funding some projects. And that's the kind of work I was expecting. Is are like, you planning to eventually put those people out of business with a better solution though? <laughs> well, I'm sure there will, we'll have other problems. Um, I've never run out of problems. I don't know about you, but like every time I've solved one, I find like three other opportunities or problems. So the timeline's yeah. probably long enough to make enough money, right? Yeah, for this to be widely adopted, I imagine it'd be. I, I'm optimizing for adoption velocity because it's going to take so long if we don't. Right? I, I don't expect this to be like next year, but um, I think this like if, the people that like the people that like wrangle S bombs and CVEs and like manually, they probably like would rather actually find real security bugs and yes. like, right. <laughs> like, and then just report that and it just propagates through the ecosystem. So, so I, I mean, my, yeah. My last question is timeline related to, what is your yeah. dream drop for a developer version of this to start playing around? I mean like timeline? Yeah. I think that depends on the community a lot. I mean, Bloomberg's funding this and kicking it off, but um, if the more people we get involved, the better. Um, I think it's realistic that we can get CMake and CPS in the next couple of years. CBS and CMake to work together. 
but we'll see. I mean, if, if, we, if we make a lot of missteps because we find out the hard way that we didn't account for something important or, or an entire ecosystem, then we may have to, we may need a CPS version two before it's really like fully here or something, yeah. Hey, yeah, thank you for the talk and getting all of this going. I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit more about what we get for CMake builds out of CPS files that we don't get with CMake files, or is it really just about providing interfaces to other build systems and, and package managers? Well, I think you get better integration with the, the packaging systems would be one thing, okay. right? And, and other tooling. And, and, and like I said, you know, some of the future things you could potentially do with this that, that would allow for better analyzing of errors and things like that. Um, you know, so outside tools could potentially come in and look, look at these files and, and do them. So I think you'd get that advantage. But like from within my own CMake file for the package I'm building, there's not really going to be any differences. Uh, well, and like that's part of the goal in some ways, right? Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like you, 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 wouldn't, you wouldn't have any pain to move in. I would expect the benefits to come in and more ecosystem benefits. So like maybe your IDE could actually give you a nice pop-up saying, hey, you don't have your dependency installed. You should like, I know how to do Conan or VC package. Let me help you out there. Like that kind of thing. Does that make sense? So like I expect yes. there to be benefits, but maybe not in like the build button, you know? Yeah, okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah, thank you for the talk. Uh, since we're talking about postmodern and unification, my question is, what are your thoughts around using more standard language for CMake files, like Conan uses Python? And, you know, did you consider this option? Is it on the table? I was worried you are gonna ask a postmodern philosophy question. <laughs> um, yeah, what, Bill, you should probably answer that one. Yeah, I mean, that's, it, it gets asked a lot, you know, why, why not use a new language for CMake? I mean, one of the design choices early on was that CMake would only depend on a C++ compiler um, because you're guaranteed to have one of those if you're building C++. Um, that said, um, the language could use an upgrade um, and it really would depend on more funding sources and someone really interested in doing that, whether it happens or not. Um, there's been some movements, um, but I, I don't see us rushing, rushing down the, the road. I mean, I think it'll be more incremental improvements, um, but, you know, but it's kind of separate from uh, this discussion. Yeah, it's, I just realized the reason I'm asking, uh, you know, having to learn another language is probably could be one of the hurdles for adoption. Yeah, I think, I think there might be opportunities here though. Like with this interop, there are other things that could happen with CMake. Like maybe there's a CMake 4 and it's not source compatible with CMake 3, but this provides certain kinds of interoperability that we didn't have before. Um, but, you know, we'll see. Um, like it's hard to answer too, too much and probably we need to focus more on getting this finished and shipped and stuff. And I think, I think that's what Bill's saying. That being said, if someone came along with big piles of money, I'm sure Kitware could walk and chew gum at the same time, to, so to speak, on this. Um, yeah. Understood. Thank you. Yep. Thank you for the talk. Uh, I would really love to see CPS succeed. But as I was listening to the talk, I couldn't help but remember the XKCD standards comic. And I'm wondering, how do you go about preventing CPS from becoming the 15th way to define right. C++. I, I, I was literally talking to someone about, like, I should just get that slide up there so I can bring this up. And I wasn't sure I had time, so I'm glad you were asked that question. I think this is a different, this is the base case. We're going from zero to one. There is no library standard. Like, where's the other library standard? I mean, the closest thing is the CMake files, but as we all know, that's like not really a standard. It's like in that ecosystem how you use it, but that's not, everyone's not using that, right? So that's what we were just talking about, right? So that's my answer. It's like, we're going from zero to one, so it's not the same comic. If someone says, why do you have the first standard? Like, well, that's the answer. Why do we have any standards, right? So. Thank you. Yep. I have two questions. It directly relates to that one. Um, there are package managers that ship metadata for libraries. Mm -hmm. um, why not just extend one um, as the starting point? I, I mean, someone can. Um, the, the big concern about, from my perspective, is that to get the velocity, to get the saturation in the ecosystem that I think we need to get critical mass on this, you're going to have to do, uh, you're going to have to port everyone into that s space, and you're going to have to pull people out of things that they're already comfortable in, um, and disrupt 
the other work that they're really wanting to do. Like nobody's like in the business of literally moving C++ code between package managers. They're in the business of making cars and video games and you know, financial applications. And so if you say like, well, I mean, if you say stop the world, go do packaging, that's not gonna happen. So we have to figure out ways to make that something that they can do while they're doing their other work, like for free or cheap. And I think maybe someday we get there. Maybe someday we find, by the way, it has to be a polyglot package manager. It's not gonna be just a C++ one, but we get the, the, the Omega package manager where everyone just uses that and it works everywhere. Um, maybe this helps enable that though. So I'm not pessimistic about getting there someday. I just don't know if that's the first. But I think, I think we are asking for that, right? If, if, if the package maintainer, if they, if they look at it and say, hey, you know, our thing is better than what you did for CPS and here's why and it, it expresses this stuff, we're open to that, right? This is, a, this is an early version. Yeah. And we have been talking to you know, people working on Conan and, and, and other package managers. So. Right. The, the specific one I've been playing with recently is Conda and they ship a metadata file that, that overlaps with a lot of the details and works in many languages on many targets. Right, um, right but I don't, expect, I don't expect the Go users to switch to Conda. I don't expect the Rust users to switch to Conda. I don't expect but, the Bazel users to switch to Conda. I do expect them to be, I think it's a reasonable ask if they work with CPS files to the extent that they're there. Yeah. So I, I got, that's always my point about Polyglot, is like I feel like C, C and C++ by their nature go to your problem. You, they, you don't go to it, you don't go to them. If, you need, if you're writing Python code and you need to drop down, you're in a Python ecosystem and you need some C in there, that's a, that's a very valid and, and essential use case for C and C++. If we say instead, no, oh, Python people, if you really want to call C, go over it, get, get rid of pip, go to our package manager. It's just not going to happen, right? They're going to switch to another language or I, something. I, so I, like, I, I, I really strongly feel that like the goal here is that you have a really good project and you click the button to say, sure, it goes to pip, sure, it goes to Conan. And the CPS data makes, is that bridge that makes that possible. I think, um, worried I'm, I'm, I didn't communicate that well. Right. Um, I'm not talking about like adapting the Conda package manager, the Conda metadata. Or the metadata. The, the format. metadata format. Why not just start with the metadata um, format? Well, I mean, we're open to, you, if you want to write up a proposal on how that metadata format would be better than the JSON we're talking about, we'd, we'd entertain that, I think. Okay. Um, um, but we just, you know, this is, this is a starting point, but um, yeah. The, the, second, the second thing is, I heard you briefly mention a name registry. Mm -hmm. That sounds like a huge can of worms. Package managers already deal with that. Right. Um, maybe don't start another one? I think the goal would be, for that would be to make it easier to be a package manager. So like ideally if we came up with something, it wouldn't be a competition, it would be, be more like USB vendors, if that makes sense. Like, like people to reserve numbers. Yeah, you, you could like it would just be like describing the the maintainer, some amount of ownership, credentialing, versioning, like version se sequences of versions, and like you know again things that might you see again in a CPS in a sort of software build materials to kind of like connect the dots. Like that's what I'm envisioning. Um, and then like things like Conan and VC package would just have their their lives would get easier. Like, oh, I just go to that thing and pull it down. Great, that's what I want, right? And Bloomberg has these use cases internally, and so it would be good for Bloomberg to be like, again, like when we, when we mirror source packages, you get it there. We have things kind of like that, like GitHub kind of does that, but it'd be great if it was like, you know, a more standard open thing. And importantly, that that kind of information could also include closed source um, dependencies, because that's a very essential requirement for a lot of ecosystems that closed source binaries get supported in different ways. Thank you. You showed on one of your slides uh, a package.cps.in template file. Yeah. Uh, I'm wondering, are those kinds of like human written templates how you envisage this being typically done versus using like purely CMake generated uh, based on your like target exports and stuff? Right. I expect modern actively maintained build systems will support CPS. Um, maybe I'm over expecting things, but that's what I, would, I, th I think this is a reasonable ask. It's gonna be easier than you know, picking up a new OS or something, I, I think. Um, I, this, is, this is the if all else fails option. If all else fails, you, you know, it's not hard to make a JSON file. So like this would, like you don't even need your make file to understand JSON for this to work, for example. It just needs to know how to run said, which make files run all the time. Right, that's, that's all I was trying to get across. Does that make sense? 
Like if you're in auto tools, I don't expect auto tools to, to put a fine point on it to, to support uh, auto conf, auto like plain make files. I don't expect them to support CPS directly because they don't have that kind of model. It just doesn't work that way. But they, they might do they might do it, some of this. And and that's important to point out though, because some of the projects that use those build tools are the most important projects. Like open SSL. Maybe someday it uses CMake, maybe it does. Maybe I picked a bad example, but some of those really low level ones are like that because they want to be so portable that you don't even need a build system. You just need bash and a compiler and you can get somewhere. Um, we want those dependencies to link. So we still want those CPS files. Great, sense? thanks. Yeah. Over time. Uh, defense, sure. defense contractors, large and small, are huge users of not only C++, but other languages as well. Mm -hmm. This is a big, big problem for defense contractors and by extension, the US government, and yep. there's a lot of money at stake here. So yep. my question is, have you spoken to already or do you have plans to talk to representatives from the defense industry to talk about a way forward that is a standard way forward and perhaps get US government funding for something that is of extreme cost and significance to not only the US government, but other governments and us taxpayers as well. Well, I, I, I doubt Bloomberg's gonna do that because it's not really, I know it's a different business entirely. It's not the same kind of problems. Although there is some but, overlap with like, but maybe Kitware has it. But yeah, Kitware's <laughs> definitely in that space. I mean, we're 80% uh, government funded. Um, I have talked to some folks in the government. Um, you know, I, I think it's definitely a possibility. Um, and if you have uh, contacts or information, I'd be willing to pitch the idea and uh, move this forward uh, yeah. through that route. Yeah, we're making a very specific pitch for that sector because we understand that. And, and, but we need some people you know, to step up and, le and lead in different ways there. And that's a big opportunity for those people. Right, so yeah. I, are you looking for a, a C++ ISO an ISO mm -hmm. C++ standard? Yep. Or a worldwide ISO standard that has, like you said, is a polyglot solution? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I'm not an ISO pro procedure expert. Um, I think we, we have the consensus in this ecosystem to get a C++ standard. If, and I think implicitly it has to work for C. Um, maybe the C people will also do some kind of vote to say, that, yeah, we like it too. But again, they, they're a language standard, not a tooling standard either. Yeah. If, they, if someone that knows you know, how to ISO, hack ISO processes or whatever, so, so to speak, um, wants to like help make sure that that gets cross-pollinated to the other parts of ISO properly, that's, that's interesting. Yeah. But it's not something I'm an expert in, so I can't really tell you exactly how and when and why that would be a good idea. But I, I like the idea. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Last one. So uh, I think this is going to be easy. This is not a question. I wanted to just publicly thank uh, Bill for what he said. Uh, this attitude, being so open and generous to open your, because you're, with your position, see make position in the market, you, can, you could not do, do this. Being that open is exactly what we need for the C++ ecosystem. And I wanted to say thank you, because this is truly heroic. So thank you. Yep, I agree. All right, we're out of questions and out of time. So, uh, right. Thank thanks. you, everybody. Thank you.